Well, hello, all you lovely people. Um, this auditorium is really pretty and a little bit intimidating, but seeing all these beautiful queer faces out here makes it a little bit less scary. Um, and I have cute little chairs to lounge in in case I feel the need. Uh, so I'm Jacob, uh, and I'm a genderqueer writer, advocate, uh, part-time performer, and, uh, and all-around uh, awareness builder for genderqueer and non-binary folks. And today, I wanted to take the time to share some space with you and talk about an alternative approach to gender diversity. Um, because, I don't know about y'all, but I'm a little bit bored of the approaches that we have uh, currently and think them are a little bit stale. It's kind of like an old bagel. Like, not, not like a, a week old, but like a, like a day old, where it's like, I know there's something kind of off here, but I might be lazy and eat it anyway, but I feel like we can do better as a community. And I feel like we deserve better as a community. So that's what I'm gonna walk y'all through today. Um, but first, I wanna start with what everyone starts with, because we're queer and we love our stories, is a little bit of my story, because uh, we're going to talk about all this stuff on kind of a structural and systemic level, and that's really exciting and that's really fun, and I love talking in that way. But before we do that, I want to ground it in sort of like real experience. And so for the personal section, I'm going to sit in a chair so that you know I'm like up here with you. Um, so uh, this story starts, as every good story starts, with an awkward childhood photo. Um, as, as a young little kid, I was very gender fluid and very gender creative, uh, and, and, and it was just sort of instinctual to me, right? And I have a story that I like to tell about my childhood uh, from Halloween in 1998 when I was uh, seven years old. Uh, I remember going to the Toys R Us with my mom. And I, know, like, I don't know if you all like, remember buying Halloween costumes, but it's a very anxiety-inducing process as a child because you sort of uh, get the one day to kind of really express like, who you are and, and, and you gotta do it just right and all that other kind of stuff. And also, like, spatially, when you're like a little child, like, the wall of costumes is very large. Um, so I remember looking at that, my mom said, well, what do you want to be, Jacob? Uh, and I, I turned to her, and I had this moment of trepidation, and I was like, well, should I, should I ask for what I want, right? Should I be honest and, and ask her for what I'd like to be? And I was like, I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, and of course, keep in mind that this is the 90s, so I, I didn't, and I was seven, so I didn't have like a complicated or nuanced uh, inter like analysis of kind of cultural appropriation and all of those sorts of things. So I turned to my mom, and I say, uh, mom, I want to be Pocahontas, uh, which, I, again, I would not advocate for anybody to, who is, does not identify as Native American to wear a Native American costume for Halloween. Um, but in the context of my childhood, I was like, well, Pocahontas is obviously the most badass Disney princess, um, and that's who, I, I mean, like, she runs around the woods, and she wears super cute dresses, and she talks to trees, and these are all things that spiritually resonate with me as a child. Um, so I, I, I gather my courage, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask my mom about it. And it, it felt like, I knew I was walking out on a limb, right? I knew I was kind of like, teetering towards the edge, and I was like, is this, is this gonna work? I don't know, we'll see. So I ask mom, I think I want, that's who I wanna be. And she says, she sort of looks at me and she calculates, right, I can see her calculating, between do I affirm my child, or do I uh, have to deal with the consequences um, of, of letting my kid wear a dress in front of their father, and then in front of the entire neighborhood trick-or-treating, right? And I saw her weighing those two options, and I was standing out on the edge of this limb, and she was just sort of, she kind of had this sad look come over her and she just said, do you think you want to be one of the other characters from the movie? Uh, which was crushing on kind of an identity level, right? But was also stupid because everyone else in that movie pretty much sucks. <laughs> um, so I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so at any rate, I, I walked out onto the limb and it broke, right? I, it couldn't support me. And I learned from a very early age a pattern of like, it's not really worth trying, right? So fast forward, you know, way past childhood. And I'm working my first big girl internship in New York City at the United Nations. Um, and it's, I'm facing the exact same scenario with my boss this time, where I've sort of shown up in like a suit and tie for a very long time uh, while I was starting there because I didn't know how to be authentic. And then I was like, one day I was like, I'm gonna try. So I brought my Hillary Clinton pumps, you know, they're like two inches, pointy toe, not too high, not too short, they're perfect. Um, and, I, and I wore them to work and I was like, I'm just gonna do this, let's see. And I, and I walked around all day in my heels and no one said anything, which is how I knew there was a problem, right? No one, because they were cute shoes and I looked good, and no one complimented me. Um, so I was like, okay. Uh, and then a, a few days later, I had a conversation with my boss. Um, and she said, um, and she's still a great mentor of mine today uh, and, and, is, and is a huge supporter of mine. But she said, look, 
I just want you to know what you're walking into, right? I want you to know that the international system is perhaps not as idealistic as you'd like it to be. And that maybe it can't, there are gonna be folks who aren't gonna to wanna to work with you and are going to make your career a lot more difficult if this is something that, like, that, that's important to you. And, I'm, and when I'm, say, I'm saying this not to dissuade you from, uh, from being yourself, but I'm saying it so that you're aware of what you're walking into, right? So that you know, so that you're, because I respect you and I want you to hear that. Which was sort of a good response, right? For a young professional at that time, I was, I was 20, 21, um, and that scared, my, that scared the pants off me. And I was like, I'm done. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So fast forward a little bit later, and I graduate from college, right? And like every college person, you sort of know yourself by the end of college in a way that you kind of have to backtrack on after you graduate, right? Like this is my graduation outfit. I have my little Jackie Kennedy, except like sort of a little bit like, you know, shorter probably than what she would have worn. But I was like, I'm going to show those fat boys what's for. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I was facing this dilemma of like, where do I go with this, right? How do I bring this into the adult world? I'm scared. Um, and so I started off my career in Washington, D.C., and very quickly realized, like, this city is not going to go anywhere for me. Um, and just to be real, right, like, people looked at me like I was from Mars. People looked at me like I was, like, like they, I, looked, I felt people, I could feel when I walked into the room that I was a political liability. Like, people looked at me and they're like, is someone going to take a picture with me and this kid? Because, like, that might not do well with my constituents, <laughs> right? I could feel that energy. No one would ever say it openly because they're too polite and Southern, but that was what was going on. Um, so I was like, okay, I guess this isn't going to work. And so I moved to New York. Um, and, you know, I have a relatively fabulous life in New York. I work at a lesbian foundation full time. Um, I am fortunate enough to be able to express myself authentically in a way that feels good most days. But the reality is that that whole map shouldn't have to be there in the first place, right? It shouldn't be that complicated. I shouldn't have had to think so proactively about my gender identity every time I wanted to make a professional decision, right? There should have been a world that was built for me that, that could see me and that would give me space. And that's what I want to talk to you all about today. So we are in a moment of incredible trans visibility, as you all know. Trans people are everywhere, right? They're on the cover of New York Magazine. They're on the cover of Time. There is, they are on reality television and every news magazine and all the newsstands, right? Um, they are on the cover of Men's Health for the first time, looking fine. And, you know, they're on TV. They're the best that television has to offer right now. Trans people are everywhere. And I think that companies are starting to notice this, right? Companies are like, oh, this whole trans thing's everywhere. But I wonder if underneath all of that, they're asking perhaps what is a more important question, which is, what is gender anyway? So we're going to review, and this is going to be very 101 for some of you, and you're going to be like, I know this already, but just bear with us because there might be some people in the room And it's a good conceptual model to note in case you need to regurgitate it at a moment's notice when some CEO walks into your office and says, explain gender to me, okay, because that might happen, it probably will. If you're like the one queer person in your office, they're probably going to ask you to explain gender to me. Um, not that I know that from personal experience or anything. So this is what we are taught about gender when we grow up, right? That gender is men and women. Just by a show of hands, how many people grew up with this model of gender? Okay, great. We grew up relatively in the same, like, country. Um, because that's, and that's true, right? Because gender models change as you go around the world, and they are not universal, and we'll get to that. Um, so this is what we're taught about gender, but this is not what gender really is. This is a gross oversimplification. This is like the least scientific analysis of anything. If this, is, this is like looking at the market of candy bars and being like, well, there's chocolate and then there's candy. <laughs> and that's the market. And, and I'm going to figure out how to sell more candy, right? Like, that's not rigorous. That wouldn't fly with any of your bosses or anyone that you work with. So what is gender really? Gender is a spectrum, not a binary. It's a social construct, not a foundational truth. It's culturally specific, not universal. It's a system of power that is structurally incapable of, of equality, I would argue. And it is a method of organizing bodies and behaviors. So really, gender looks a little something like this, although it's, in reality it could be even more complicated. You have your physical sex, which is, you know, your body. You have your gender identity, which is how you feel, who you know yourself to be. And you have your gender expression, which is what you show the world. And these things can be aligned, they can be misaligned, there's all kinds of places you can be on the map. So you can be cisgender, which is what we would think of as normal, uh, where you can be, and let's, let's take a cisgender woman, for example. You're probably assigned female at birth, you probably identify as a woman, and you have a relatively feminine gender expression, right? So then if you look on this little map here, you are conveniently in this end zone. See, I can make a sports metaphor. Um, I know, right? Didn't expect that, but these are that. Uh, 
But now I want to talk about a conventional trans narrative. And, and I say conventional because this is what is out there in all the media that we're consuming, pretty much. So a conventional trans narrative, which is something that probably by now a lot of your bosses will be familiar with, right? Is that for a trans woman, is that you're assigned male at birth by a doctor. You identify as a woman, but odds are for your own safety for a long period of your life, you're going to have a masculine gender uh, presentation because you need to do that in order to survive. But the hope, if we have all the right systems in place, is that you will be able to, over time, get access to the medical care that you need and, and the pr appropriate health systems to put your body more in line with where your heart is and be able to express your gender externally in a way that feels good for you, right? And then if you look, you've made a touchdown. <laughs> so where are non-binary people? Well, I'm mapping myself here because I, you know, I'm a little bit of a diva. I need to do a little something like that. And, and on this map, I don't really kind of work very well in this whole end zone football metaphor. Uh, I was assigned male birth. I'm kind of like, uh, uh, maybe towards, more towards women politically uh, in the middle, kind of identitary wise. Um, and I have a relatively androgynous gender presentation, right? Like, you know, good facial hair, some nice plunging bees, cute skirts, but also like a nice little fuzzy down here. You know, I'm kind of like right in the middle. And if you look, I don't get to make a touchdown, which is sad because that means I don't get like however many points you get when you make a touchdown. <laughs> and to me, the gender spectrum really looks something more like this. <laughs> you can study this later in the materials that we'll hear about. Uh, and I'm not the only one like this, right? So the Human Rights Campaign in 2013 did a national youth survey. They surveyed thousands of people. And they found out of people who don't identify as cisgender men or cisgender women, out of young folks, one third used the word transgender to describe their identity. Two thirds used something else entirely. So what that tells you in business terms is that this is an emerging market, right? <laughs> this is huge growth potential, right? We need to transform the gender binary because in fact, all trans people are gender non-conforming at some point during their transition. And gender non-conforming people are gender non-conforming all the time, generally. Sometimes I wear sweatpants. Uh, <laughs> and here's the last little secret, because I know I'm at time, I'm so sorry, uh, is that this model isn't just bad for trans and gender non-conforming people like me. In fact, this model is bad for gender non-conforming people and trans people, as we've discussed. But it's also bad for butch women, it's bad for dapper women, it's kind of bad for femme women, and it's really pretty much bad for all women, right? And actually it's bad for sensitive men and fabulous men and pretty much all men too, right? Like this whole having this island that you have to stay on, this clear border of what is and is not acceptable, that ruins your ability to authentically relate to other people. That makes it so much harder to like just relax at work and have a good time. That makes it so much more difficult to relate to the people around you. So. Each of us has had our gender expression corrected or policed in some way at work. I know that every single person in this room has had that happen over and over again. And literally, like if you're a femme, if you're a butch, it doesn't matter because that's how double standards work under patriarchy, is that everyone gets their gender policed because everyone has done something wrong, quote unquote, at some point in time. And that's discouraging. It makes us feel isolated. It reduces creativity, which reduces innovation, which is bad for business and for life. Right? So we gotta do away with this system that we have. We have to start thinking about gender diversity in a broader way. So instead of thinking about gender diversity as a quantitative problem, we need to start thinking about gender diversity as a qualitative problem. And we need to start listening and centering the experiences of gender nonconforming and transgender people because they have some of the most insight about how the system works on all levels. And to do that, we have to ask open-ended questions, not just closed questions about how many people do we have, right? That doesn't cut it anymore. You need to go to an actual trans person or gender non-conforming person in your community or in your workplace if you, don't, you know, if you don't have anybody in your workplace in your community and ask them, what experiences are you having? What is working for you and what is not working for you? And when you ask those open-ended questions, you have to be willing to actually hear their answers. So if I say to you, I need a gender neutral restroom, I need it because I want to be able to pee without feeling like a pariah, right? You can't, if you ask that question, you have to be willing to actually hear my answer and say, you know what, we're gonna think about a way to gradually transition to have gender inclusive restrooms on all floors everywhere there are restrooms in our entire office, right? That is not a ridiculous thing to ask. That is something that is good for everyone. That is something that is going to solve our gender problem for everybody, not just for you. It's not a niche need, it's a group need. It's a collective need. 
So, so the, the bottom line is just, as I said, that these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of innovations aren't just something that benefit people like me. They benefit everybody. So we need to start talking about gender-neutral facilities. We have to talk about proactive pronoun options. We have to have broader gender categories on our paperwork. And we have to have conversations and training about gender non-conforming folks and probably have critical masculinities conversations. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what I have for y'all today. Those are all my ideas. Um, and, and I'm really excited to continue a conversation. I don't have time for questions right now or any queries. I couldn't resist the pun. Uh, but I'm going to be around all day. So please, like, feel free to come engage me. Uh, we can keep talking. Let's start talking about gender diversity in a way that actually sees what's going on. Um, let's have a more nuanced conversation. I am tired of that stale bagel, okay? Uh,